10 second security tip, go. If you have not already, join an ISAC, which is an information sharing analysis center. Join the one for your industry and then join the one for your customers and partner. It's invaluable the information you're going to get out of this information sharing group. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And with me, as always, is Mike Johnson, the CISO of Lyft. We are available at CISOseries.com. Mike, I'm right now in New York. You are back in the Bay Area. I'm going to do a live show, unfortunately not with you. So I, I'm sorry, but we had so much fun on our last one just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun doing that. And uh, I'm a little bit disappointed that I'm not able to be there for this live recording, but I know John is going to knock it out of the park with you. Yeah, so John Procap, who he's referring to, is the CISO of HarperCollins. He's been a great participant in articles that I've written in the past, and that is show when this podcast drops will be that evening, the the day this podcast episode drops. So if you're in New York, you're hearing this, you're available, just go to CISOseries.com. You'll see a, um, a link to the meetup event, but it's near the uh, World Trade Center area where the event is happening. And I also want to remind people that we have another podcast, Defense in Depth. Mike, you were on our first episode, and our second episode is about privacy. And I just want to explain to people that our editorial mandate on that show, Defense in Depth, is we choose only topics for which the InfoSec community has shown that there's great interest, meaning the topic we choose will always have popular appeal. And if you want to pitch me anything – make sure you include a link to a post where there's a lot of discussion and debate on that topic. Because I've received a lot of pitches, great ideas, but kind of our editorial mandate is we got to prove everyone's really obsessed with that. So go and search and subscribe to Defense in Depth on your favorite podcast app or go to our site. You can find it there. By the way, if you're interested in sponsoring, contact me as well. Just go to CISOseries.com for that info. All right. That was just the stuff I wanted to get out of the way at the beginning. Now I want to introduce our guest. It is Susie Smybert, the CISO of Fitting International. Susie, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Thanks for having me, David and Mike. It's a pleasure being here. Why is everyone talking about this now? So I just got this right into the rundown because it was breaking news, and that is about Facebook. Once again, they, they're kind of really stuck their foot in it, didn't they, Mike? Yeah, I'm, I'd like to say that I'm shocked by this, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a pattern of behavior here. So there you go. Well, I, I want to just quickly say, and, and Susie join in is, I think the problem here is their product is essentially the users. They really trade, sell off of our behavior. So the more they know about us, the more they can sell the product. They don't really have you know, and, and I'm using this loosely, they don't really have a product beyond us. I mean, they do sell other things there, but we are the core product. So this is why like Apple can mock them because Apple has a hard product. You know, both you, Susie, and you, Mike, actually have an actual real product that isn't trading only on user behavior. So anyways, what I found so ironic about this whole nonsense of this is to activate this app that was essentially watching everything a person did, even their personal messages, there was a button that said trust. So <laughs> Mike, what does the word trust now mean? Or do you think this is now making your job that much harder? Trust has always been an overloaded term. It means many things to many different people. And in this case, that that button trust is... That's a word that was built into the operating system for that prompt. In one way, it wasn't Facebook who chose that word. On the other hand, there, there is a lot of irony to it. And I, I want to go back to what you were saying about the fact that Facebook doesn't have a product to sell. And I, I was thinking about this. They're not the only ones who make all of their money off of advertising. There are other companies who've been able to to still monetize clicks and monetize views without continuing to 
almost stumble over themselves. Granted, I think I think what we're seeing is Facebook is still trying to catch up and it's a catch up at all costs mantra. If you look at Google, Google had a lot of privacy snafus back in the day. And I think the, the, the primary difference between these two is when Google was making their big mistakes, we weren't as privacy conscious in the world. And Facebook is making these mistakes in a world that has changed. And it wouldn't surprise me if there's some discussion going on in Facebook saying, well, Google screwed up back then and that was okay. We can screw up now. We can do these experiments now and, and that'll be okay. But they haven't realized that the world has changed. Well, I don't think they have because of the letter of defense they put up. But Susie, I want you to jump in on this. What's your feeling about where they believe their trust is allowed to sort of push, I guess? I believe it's fundamentally wrong. And though you're right, Mike, Google and other organizations have made problem and challenge with privacy as well. And we're more aware than ever. But the demographic Facebook is after is 13 to 17 years old. They say it's 5%. But I am convinced it's more than 5%. It's the people that they want to use a platform. Those are kids. The concept of privacy and how it's going to hurt them in the future, it's not something they can really understand and grasp. It's really not an informed consent. I found it's very disingenuous from Facebook to say, oh, I've done it. We were just doing market research and data. You're doing market research and looking at every single thing the user is doing on their phone while those users are teenagers. That's horrible, really horrible of these kids growing up in that world with organization they're supposed to trust and the platform they're supposed to be using. I, I can't condone this. Even though other have made challenge in the past, this is going against a vulnerable part of our population, which is not as educated or as aware of what it means because they're kids. Now, I don't believe that you market to kids at all, Susie, but, no. uh, to, 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 but to a level, I got to assume, Mike, that you have some young users of your product. Yes. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We, we, oh, have, a, we have a minimum age where we enforce it. We have public documentation about what we expect of our drivers. If a kid does get in their car, we actively do not advertise to non-adults. If we find them on our platform, we kick them off. We are, it is a very hard line for us. Isn't this sense of consciousness of, you know, because you brought this up, Mike, well, maybe this is wrong. I mean, have we ever gotten that sense from, from Facebook? And I also want to throw it in, I know this is a completely different question, but how is this behavior affecting your business, if at all? I think it's laziness, Mike, if I can jump in. Please, sure. They're consuming all of the data they can, and that's not what they need. If their purpose is really to understand the usage of apps, a time spent looking at videos and how they're behaving with their widget, they are consuming a lot more data than what is required for that purpose. If Facebook was to do research and only absorb the data that they need in order to do the research and not everything else, then perhaps it wouldn't be so lazy for me. But the easiest thing is get everything and deal with privacy later. I found this just lazy and that's making our industry, there's going to be a question of give me everything because I don't know what I'm going to need. They need to know what they need first, given the privacy implication of doing what they were doing. How CISOs are digesting the latest security news. From the UK, the Cyber Skills Impact Fund will receive a nice boost of 500 thousand pounds to attract more people to cybersecurity, but specifically a diverse workforce. Now, we have talked at great length about the need to have a diverse security staff. And Mike, you said on a previous show, not having diversity actually makes you less secure because you fall into the one thing. So I'd like to delve into this more. Mike, can you actually point to an example anytime that you worked, whether current job or past, where one of your diverse employees made a suggestion that was outside of what everyone was else was thinking? Nothing comes immediately to mind, but you can see a dynamic when different people are in a room for discussion where those diverse opinions, the diverse backgrounds come into play and steer a conversation. And, and that's really what I'm talking about in terms of needing that diversity. The, the conversation takes a different path. It has, it's looking at it from more angles, hearkening back to our previous discussion 
there might be situations where someone is suggesting, hey, in this bubble that I live in, this is okay. And someone who doesn't live in that same bubble doesn't has never been in that bubble says, wait, you know, hey, hey, hey you know, hang on here, hang on a minute here. And that's really what I see almost day to day where those discussions take a different path. That's a good point. Susie, I know you're very passionate about this topic. Where have you seen the most success in bringing a diverse staff? In many angles, to be honest, David, we've got higher retention. We're able to attract more talent. We have better overall employee engagement and we innovate more because you can't be what you can't see. So the more diverse candidate you have, the more they reach out into their own network to bring on board other candidates that are normally not going to be attracted to work in cybersecurity. You mentioned innovation. How are you to innovate better? Is it kind of like what Mike described? It's just when you have the dynamic of all the people in the room, people sort of engage differently? Totally. When you think of the diversity of thought that you bring, when you have teams that are from diverse backgrounds, diverse gender or age or experience, when the team understand that everybody has their own stories to come to the table. There's no stupid question and it helps bring stuff that you wouldn't even think of. When you have a bunch of cybersecurity professional in the room and they look at a problem, they're used to the same path of one through 10 in order to reach the outcome they want. But if you bring someone that is a paralegal, for example, or that comes from a HR background that you're bringing into their sock, they're going to have questions that nobody even think of because they're just thinking differently. And when you stop because your team is embracing that diversity and inclusion, that's when you can really innovate because they're not shunning those ideas. They're welcoming stuff that is out of the left field because our brain as cybersecurity professional might not be trained to think in that way. So harvesting this helps you get faster, better, sooner, further ahead because you have that diversity of thought, not just gender. It could be people on the spectrum from, from every walk of life. There is something that can help us make more secure, more aware, and better organizations overall. So last night, I'm here in New York City. I got a chance to have drinks with a listener, Keith Franco, who runs security over at McCarter in English, a law firm. And he has hired two women. And he said that the women that he specifically hired had amazingly good soft skills. And I don't know how much you guys look for that in each individual employee or when you're specifically hiring in diversity, but he said that was critical for his work because the volume of compliance work they have to do across multiple industries is insane. And so like what you just said, Susie, they are dealing with multiple different departments and need to be able to communicate to different departments and get the information you just referred to out of different departments. How are you sort of gauging people for soft skills and how important is that in your security hiring? I'll ask you, Mike. That is something that we measure for every interview. We're looking for soft skills for everyone. It's hard to plan in advance who someone might be interacting with and hiring anyone onto the team who has terrible soft skills, regardless of their position, is not going to go well. So so soft skills are extremely important, even in an engineering-focused company like ours, where we want to make sure that everyone is able to engage with anyone. Everyone is able to then build on top of each other's soft skills, as it were. So across the board, we're measuring that for everyone during every interview. It's time to play What's Worse? All right, Susie, I think you know how this game is played. I'm going to give you two scenarios. Both are awful, but you have to determine which of the two is worse. I've got a great question from Bakatam Vakar, a VP of InfoSec from a large financial institution. Asks this question, what's worse, keep delaying or not patching app vulnerability or keep delaying or not installing an L7 web application firewall? So which one is worse? So for this one, this one's actually pretty easy for me. I'm not a fan of uh, of L7 firewalls in general. Okay. So I, for for me, the the worst one in this would be delaying patching. I feel that if you're on top of your patching, if you've got other mitigating controls, 
you're going to be in much better shape if you're patching. So not patching is the, is the worst one of the two. And can you give a quick snippet of why you're not a big fan of the L7 WAF? Let's just say a uh, past bad experience that's hard to get rid of, where we've had, uh, have been in organizations where an L7 firewall has brought down the application as a whole. And I feel that you can mitigate in other ways at an application layer what's going on. That said, they have a place I do see in certain applications where they make a lot of sense. But if my choice is L7 firewall or patching, I'm, I want patching every time. All right, Susie, I'm going to you. Do you agree or disagree with Mike? Which one's worse? I agree with Mike. I wish I could disagree so we could have a great debate. <laughs> but realistically, patching is foundational. You, you can always have mitigating control. If you have proper patching, proper coding in place, you're having people with your DevSecOps as opposed to just DevOps, the L7 firewalls, it becomes a little bit, it's great, but it's not crucial. The same way it would be to have proper methodology as well as patching. Those are the foundations. If you've got that in place, you can't delay this. All right. You know what? I'm going to throw one more out. Let's do this one quickly. I got another what's worse scenario. This one comes from Carlos Solis Salazar, who's the CIO of Escuela Latino America de Gerencia. And he says, what is worse? have a business continuity plan documented, but not known by the staff, or have the staff with knowledge of business continuity, but no actual plan whatsoever. So Mike, what do you think is worse? Wow, okay, that one's a hard one. Basically the question is, you've got people on the team who understand business continuity, but there's no documented plan, versus you have a documented plan, but nobody knows what it is. When it comes down to it, and, and the reason why I think this is a good question, is in either case, people are going to be scrambling around having no real idea what to do when an actual event comes on. Where I would land, since I have to answer, is having a business continuity plan that nobody knows what it is. That That's the worst one. While improvising during a an event is never a good thing, you're better positioned for improvisation if you have people who are educated and and have been through it before. All right. And, and before I throw out, Carlos actually had one of these two experiences. I won't tell you which one until Susie, you answer. And what's your answer, Susie? Which one's worse? Having a document nobody can refer to, understand, never been tested is a lot more dangerous than having people that know how to recover, it, but don't really have a plan in place that is formalized. It gives a false sense of preparedness because you, you have a plan, but nobody knows it exists. So the two of you agree that business continuity plan, but not known by the staff is far worse. I will tell you that Carlos had to deal with the latter, having no business continuity plan in place, but he knew about business continuity and he was able to handle a situation. Who's our sponsor this week? It's OpenVPN. Their product called Access Server allows you to create an economical, isolated and secure private network for your company that can really scale. Now, with this virtual private network and powerful remote access, one client of theirs securely delivers cloud-based services to more than 16,000 POS systems. Another monitors equipment at more than 4,000 telemetry locations. Now, let me list off what Access Server can do for your distributed environment. First, keep your internal data safe. Second, deploy end-to-end -end encryption. Also, block unauthorized access to your internal databases, increase mobile workforce productivity by providing secure remote access, and extend your centralized unified threat management to the remote networks. Huh. Now, this sounds pretty good, yes? Then, if you'd believe that, experience the difference for yourself. Go to openvpn.net forward slash CISO dash series to test drive access server now, and you can do it for free. And we thank OpenVPN for sponsoring this show. It's time for Ask a CISO. Tip of the hat to Schaefer Marks of ProtectWise to suggest a question about RSA pitching. So I personally am starting to get an RSA meeting requests, they all follow the same format, assuming we're getting ready and asking if we would like to meet with a VP or a CEO or some expert, or in the case of what stories I'm going to be doing. This doesn't have to be RSA specific. Susie, I'm going to throw to you first. First, are you going to RSA? Let me ask. No, I'm not. 
not required, but you've been to a conference before, right? And you've been pitched. I have. I've been to RSC before. I just have a young son and it's too young to leave overnight for too many days. <laughs> totally understood. Now, is there any kind of pre-event pitch that you do appreciate getting? I do. Not those that are targeted to a party, a dinner with a VP or anything like this. What I do like about the pre-event pitch are those that are targeting me to send my team because they have a value proposition to get my team smarter, better, more in tune with the product, leveraging a platform we already use. Those that are aimed at making my team better and equipping them with either technical skills, soft skills, or forward-looking statement, you know, that slide that everybody has, where they can get better educated in what's out there, those are going to be the hook for me. Anything for a party or dinner or meeting with yet another VP of sales, I don't really care for. All right, Mike, I'm going to toss this one to you. What is the kind of pre-event pitch you do like? Because I know there's a lot you don't like, but I want to know the kind (laughs) that you do like. I really like what Susie had to say, which was pitches towards my team. It's really more interesting to me when maybe they have more of their technical team in one place than would normally be available. And then my technical team can can sit down and, and really dig into something that we've perhaps already identified as interesting. I don't need another dinner. I, I don't need another meeting with a CEO or a VP. It's really, it's an opportunity that's rare where we have technical teams all in one place that may not already be local. So that's really what I like to see is this is the event that we're hosting that it's technical in nature. Is any of your team interested? Is any of your team available? What do you think of this pitch? Now, I have not done this segment in a while, and people told me it was one of their favorites, and I'm sorry that I hadn't been doing it in a while, but I'm bringing it back. So I should mention that I do not edit these outside of asking everyone to give me a pitch at 30 seconds. I will mention that people had trouble with that. In fact, only one sent me a 30-second pitch. The rest sent me minute-long pitches and longer. So here you go. Here's our first pitch right here. This Paul Foster sends in this pitch, and he says, CyberSec Innovation Partners Whitethorn Technology is the definitive technology for full PKI identification and lifecycle management, providing unparalleled visibility and management of certificates, keys, and key stores in an enterprise including mobile and IoT devices. Originally born within a NATO military environment to discover a very sensitive breach and now ready for commercial use, Whitethorn puts the customer back in the driving seat of digital trust vastly reducing risk of data losses, breaches, and business outages. Susie, I'll throw to you first. What do you think of that pitch? Sounds a bit like a car advertisement with unparalleled visibility. Uh, (laughs) To be honest, when I see tough enough for NATO must be good for you, it's a bit of jargon and, okay, we're a different industry. You You don't have to say the NSA, the government, the FBI, and all of those agencies are using it to make it relevant in the business world. Having worked with the military in the past, the two words, while have a lot of similarities, there's also lots of difference. And something that works in the military or defense space might be completely irrelevant for corporate or business environment. That doesn't hook me in. It just is a bit of a turn off. Mike, I know you've mentioned something very similar to this in the past. I'm assuming you're going to concur with Susie on this. Susie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for saying that, because I I completely agree. I, I I really don't have any time for, hey, this worked in the military. Hey, this was developed by the NSA and spun off. It Sometimes that might flag it as it has less chance of being successful in our world. About this pitch specifically, I do like it's short. It does get to the point. Well, all of these are going to be short, just so you know. They're all, I forced them all to be short. Great. I mean, that's that's good guidance, right, is people need to, to understand that they, they need to have economy of words. and. There is some hyperbole, some jargon that is over the top on this. This is really close. This could take a little bit of massaging. You could remove the whole NATO stuff from it, remove some of the superlatives, perhaps expand a little bit more on what enterprise use actually means in this case. And it's there. But this is one of the better pitches that I've seen. I'm going to make one small quibble that I've made in previous shows, which is the need to copy edit. And this is one thing that I've seen again and again in almost every single pitch 
is random capitalization and specifically <laughs> capitalizing features of your product. You don't capitalize a feature of your product. You capitalize your product, but not a feature of your product. That is not correct copy editing. So it's very important to do that. I, I we should mention that except for one, every single one of the pitches I received had copy editing mistakes in them, except for one. I, I like <laughs> that you bring that up, but perhaps to talk about kind of how sad of a state of affairs that we're in, I'd gotten so used to them, I gloss right over them. Well, as someone who who tries to keep things correct, but, but you think about it, they're a security company. They have to be kind of, their job is to be as perfect as possible. And if your 30 second pitch has copy editing mistakes. <laughs> I, I completely agree good. with you. The worst is when you get your first name wrong. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, that's a, that's a mail merge gone wrong. All right, I got one more pitch that is very appropriate because tonight is the Super Bowl. The tonight we're recording this and here is a pitch that another CISA actually received just this week. And it was titled, Aren't You Sick of Tom Brady? And it says, John, they hate us because they ain't us. Still here, 28 and three. These are all in quotes. And then it goes on, I'm sure you've lost count on the number of times you've heard, I hate the Patriots, as well as the number of blanketed emails you've received asking for 15 minutes of your time. I'm reaching out because the HQ of your company is in New York, and I wanted to see if you were rooting against the Patriots. I'm sure you're sick of seeing my guy, Tom Brady, lift the trophy. Our company being Boston-based, I'm with the Pats and curious to see which side you fall on. So how about a little fun in the form of a friendly wager as the Rams go head-to-head against the Patriots in Super Bowl 53? Here is my proposition. If the Patriots win again, you entertain a 15-minute chat to learn more about your current security program, what we do, and how we can improve your security. Now, I removed some specifics here, not to identify the company I should mention. However, if the Rams take home the Lombardi trophy, we send you gear from a team of your choosing. Do we have a deal? Mike, are are you holding yourself down? I utterly hate this exact pitch. I received this one and one of a similar nature this week when the NBA championships come around, especially because the Golden Gate Warriors is 10 miles down the road. I get those as well. I haven't gotten any for hockey. I guess hockey's not popular enough. I get them for baseball. These are cutesy pitches and they make an assumption that frankly, I care. And the, these are right up there with the invitations to play golf. The, these are making assumptions that I don't participate in these events. I don't care. This has wasted my time. I have no idea what your company does. I have no idea what you really want to talk about. This is, I I can't say it clear enough. I I hate this pitch. I hate pitches like this. So this is one of many you've received. Susie, what do you think of this pitch? Well, we do get hockey in Canada. We don't get baseball (laughs) or we we sometimes get a bit of football, but Quite frankly, this wouldn't even make it into my inbox. They just get filtered because it's a title that is completely irrelevant to what I do or what my team does or what's going on in your company. I probably would laugh. I might I might just even respond with just unsubscribe. It's, <laughs> it, it's, again, as Mike said, it's assuming you care. I love to do sport. I don't like to watch sport. And it's so generic. That thing in there is tailored to who I am as a person. And if you think of the world is very small. So though your H quarter might be in New York, there's a high chance this person is not even from New York and might be rooting for a team that is somewhere else. I don't know enough about football to name some some other teams, but it's full of assumption that the individual is pro football, will root for the city they are living in and would want to get 15 minutes or even get gear. What, what are you going to do with an, a football jersey after? Yeah, well, first of all, bribery is not a good idea. And second of all, who makes a bet with a random stranger? Nobody. We just don't do things like that at all. All right, let's let's wrap this whole show up. Thank you so much, Susie. You were awesome on the show. I really, really appreciate it. You were fantastic. And you brought some insight onto the show that we have not had in the past. So thank you again. Mike, I'll let you uh, laud 
Susie with compliments next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will absolutely do that. Susie, thank you so much. I really loved both the experience that you brought to the table and the dynamic nature of our conversation. This was an absolute delight to talk with you. You're an awesome guest. It was great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a great show. And anything you would like to say to the audience, are you hiring? Mike's always hiring. You're up in <laughs> Calgary. I don't know how many of our listeners are up in Calgary, but that's where you, you're based. Well, what would you like to say to the audience? We, we are hiring and we're always looking for great talents. And I, I don't want to plug exactly where I have a need because there's lots of vendor that listen to this and they're going to send me resume. But <laughs> we're, we're always looking for great talent. It doesn't need to be 20 years of experience, cybersecurity professional at all stage of the career. We're looking for talent. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, audience, for listening. And if you're hearing this on the Tuesday, we drop it in your base in New York. Please come out to our live show. Thank you again. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.